Hello, my name is Walter Mack, and today we will be talking about approach to MRI of the knee. Um, this talk is going to be very focused on approach mainly, rather than going into the um, subtle details of pathology and anatomy. And basically, I just want to show you how I go through a knee MRI, and you know what I what I go through, what I use each sequence for, and and what I what I do when I sit down to read a, a knee MRI that's on on the list. So I just want to start by showing you the routine sequences that come with the knee MR. This is a chrono PD. Here is an Axio T2 fat sat sequence. We have also sagittal PD and PD fat saturated sequences. And as we go through the different structures and um, and uh, the studies in greater detail, I'll talk about what we use each sequence for and what I use each sequence for. I want to emphasize before we really get into the details that it's really important to have multiple planes uh, up on the screen at the same time because that's what allows you to really um, see and be confident with what you're seeing on one sequence as opposed to another. So in general when I approach a knee MRI basically there are six categories of things that I look at and these include the menisci, the cruciate ligaments, the collateral ligaments, the extension mechanism, and then we'll spend a great deal of time looking at articular cartilage in the knee and then finally number six is sort of miscellaneous and this basically entails findings that weren't really addressed in the first five categories so again menisci one cruciate ligaments two cloud ligaments three extensive mechanism four cartilage five miscellaneous six okay so let's start with the menisci and as you know these are the shock absorbers of the knee and generally we will use the sagittal to look at the anterior and posterior horns of each meniscus and the chrono to look at the body uh, I want to direct your attention to the axial sequence it shows quite nicely the anterior and posterior horns of the amino meniscus and the body here as well as the anterior and posterior horns of the lateral meniscus and again the uh, body here and so what's helpful to to uh, pick up early on as well is trying to decide which side of the knee you're on when you're faced with a single sagittal uh, image and so in general the uh, medial tubal plateau is bigger and also notice the subtle concavity of the medial plateau articular surface and this uh, medial tubal plateau has been likened to um, a golf tee on the lateral side you're going to see that the articular surface is ever so slightly convex and of course if you see the proximal tubal fibrillar joint then that's a dead giveaway as well. So the normal MR appearance of menisci is that of homogeneous low signal. You should see nice well-defined sharp triangles here corresponding to the anterior and posterior horns of the lateral meniscus and if we scroll to the other side anterior and posterior horns of the amino meniscus. If we go to our chrono sequence um, likewise, we should see nice dark triangles corresponding to the bodies of each meniscus. So how do we diagnose a meniscal tear? So we diagnose a meniscal tear if one of two criteria are met. Either we see linear surfacing signal extending to either articular surface on any two images in the study corresponding to that same location. Okay or we see abnormal morphology of the meniscus on any one image anywhere in the study provided that there's been no prior surgery and the post-operative meniscus will be beyond the scope of this discussion. Okay, um, I should also point out that when we say surfacing signal we mean to either the, either the the superior articular surface, the apex, or the inferior articular surface. If you see linear surfacing signal going out back here, that doesn't count. If you see on your chrono image, for example, linear surfacing that's going off to the side like that, or over here, that actually doesn't count as well either. So it has to go to an articular surface. All right. Um, generally speaking, there are two broad categories of meniscal tears. Either you have a tear that is parallel to the meniscal fibers and that's a kind of tear where you kind of see linear surfacing signal in one image, you go to the next image you see that linear surfacing signal again and you can actually follow it on multiple contiguous either sagittal or chrono images. Contrast that with a tear that is oriented 
perpendicular to the meniscal fibers and you have a so-called radial tear. And that sort of tear manifests usually as something like this. So you're scrolling through your meniscus, it looks fine, it looks fine, it looks fine, and then suddenly you get to one image where either the meniscus looks markedly truncated or it looks grayed out or it looks white. Okay, and I find that that kind of tear is a little harder to pick up, so you have to be really vigilant. Um, if we see a meniscal tear, what should we do? First, we should describe where it is, obviously. Is it in the posterior horn? Is it in the body? Is it in the posterior horn extending into the body? Um, then we should try to decide um, what the morphology is. Is it one of these kind of longitudinal uh, or oblique tears, um, or is it a radial tear, as I mentioned previously? Uh, we should also note, too, if it is in the central two-thirds of the meniscus, the so-called white zone, which is relatively avascular, implying poor potential for healing, versus the peripheral third red zone, where there is theoretically a higher chance of, of, of healing of the tear. You may sometimes see a cyst next to the tear, so a so-called perimeniscal cyst, and generally that is a pretty good indicator that there's an underlying tear in most locations except adjacent to the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. So studies have shown that in this location um, it's not nearly as well correlated with finding a meniscal tear at arthroscopy. So if you see a cyst next to the antihorn lateral meniscus, be a little careful. Also, while we're on the subject of the antihorn lateral meniscus, and you're going to find this over and over again in MSK radiology, this is one of these structures that may normally have some increased signals, usually some strided signal. And you're just going to have to look at a lot of these before you can recognize this as being a normal appearance. For now, you just have to take my word for it that this is a normal uh, anterior horn, anterior root attachment. So the root attachments are very important. Let me just show you these root attachments on chrono and axial. So the posterior uh, root attachments of the medial and a lot of meniscus can easily be found on a chrono by scrolling to a far posterior chrono image showing the posterior horns as you can see here and then slowly scrolling maybe anteriorly one or two images and you should see nice posterior root attachments coming in. All right, And let's look for these on the um, sagittal as well. So here's our posterior horn lateral meniscus and we're just going to follow it very slowly and we're going to watch it attach right onto the tibia there just slightly anterior to where the posterior horn was. And when you're starting out I strongly encourage you to go through this exercise of ensuring that the posterior root attachments are intact because if anyone's going to miss a, miss a meniscal tear early on generally it's a posterior root tear, posterior root radial tear and the reason for this is what happens is I think people use the sagittal to look at the posterior horn which is quite customary and they scroll so fast that they don't actually realize that there's no posterior attachment and then before you know it you're into the other meniscus. Okay, so um, insist on seeing a nice posterior root attachment. If you were to overlook that, what you may also see is significant peripheral extrusion of the meniscus. So when I see peripheral extrusion of the meniscus, we don't necessarily call tear, but that's an invitation to go back and look for a possible posterior root tear of, the, of either meniscus. Um, so now let's talk about potential fake outs and what, what I mean by fake outs these are these are appearances that can mimic meniscal tears and they are all of a similar flavor i.e. there's an adjacent structure um, that we mistake as being as part of the meniscus and then we mistake the interface between the two structures as representing a meniscal tear rather than just an interface. So here's actually a nice example here. So let's start over here. If we take this far posterior coronal image, we can see here's the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. And if we took this whole structure here as representing meniscus, we would erroneously diagnose a meniscal tear here at the junction of the posterior horn and body. But if we carefully scroll back and forth, we can actually see that, in fact, this is simply the interface between the posterior horn lateral meniscus and the nearby popliteus tendon. Okay, and we'll talk about the popliteus tendon in a few minutes. If we look on our sagittal images, sometimes there's another fake out. So what 
and this is related to the meniscal femoral ligaments of Humphrey and Riskberg. So these, as you know, come off the inner aspect medial condyle and then eventually will join up with the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. And perhaps not well shown here, this ligament here is the meniscal ligament of Humphrey, Humphrey earlier in the alphabet anterior. But if we were to say, pick an image like that perhaps, um, and we interpret this here as being part of the meniscus, we might erroneously diagnose this irregularity here as representing a meniscal tear. Let's just see if it shows up nicer on the PDFS a little bit more. So if we, uh, once again, if we interpret this whole thing as being meniscus, we might call a tear conceivably over in here. An analogous situation happens anteriorly, so we have a structure known as a transverse ligament that runs from the anterior horn of one meniscus to the anterior horn of the other meniscus. Here admittedly, actually we don't see it well, and if you don't see one of these, these kind of smaller ligaments, I wouldn't worry too much. We emphasize uh, this because we just don't want people to erroneously misdiagnose meniscal tears, mainly. Okay. Uh, I, before I forget, I just want to point out that the posterior horn medial meniscus is generally tightly adherent to the uh, posterior joint capsule in this region, but on the lateral side, you generally will expect to see fluid behind the posterior horn lateral meniscus. This is normal. This is simply trace fluid within the popliteus hiatus, which is just a, a conduit into the joint. And we, all, we had talked about the popliteus tendon earlier. Great. Okay, so for now we'll we'll leave it for menisci and then we'll go on to cruciate ligaments. Okay, so let's start the ACL. I think it's trickier, and I think one of the common questions early on is what what's what plane should I use to look at the ACL? And I think the most honest answer is it's all of the above. And we're going to go over each sequence and what I look for on each of the planes uh, to get a comprehensive look at this ACL. So I think a lot of people like to start look at the ACL with the sagittal, and I do too. And, and the um, ACL uh, course, I suppose, and the alignment are best assessed on the um, sagittal sequence. But I think that's all it's good for. It gives you a good as idea of the alignment, but you'll have to get used to seeing increased signal in the ACL and recognizing that as a normal situation. So the normal alignment of the ACL should be that the ligament is either parallel to the roof of the intercarnal notch or Blumensatz line, or it can be slightly more vertical. But if it's more horizontal, then that is uh, worrisome for a tear. I like using the axial to look in particular at the femoral attachment. So this is actually one part of the ACL that should be nice and homogeneous and dark as you see here. And as we scroll from the femoral origin distally now, you're going to see normally well-defined increased signal within the ligament. Don't mistake this for a tear. This is simply the demarcation between the anteromedial bundle, anteromedial bundle and the shorter and stubbier posterior lateral bundle. And I think it's actually a good exercise to go and try to convince yourself that both bundles are there because you may have a partial thickness tear involving just one bundle and that may be a top of tip off if you only see one bundle. Uh, the chrono actually shows the femoral origin quite nicely as well, but I really like the chrono to look at the tibial insertions of these aforementioned anteromedial and posterior lateral bundles. And again, note the striated appearance of the ligament. So this is one of those structures I was talking about earlier that generally will show increased signal and can be normal. Um, so you really have to look at the morphology and orientation and alignment as well as caliber to make a call on the ACL. So if we see a tear of the ACL, generally I will semi-quantitatively describe it as either, well first, is it a partial tear or is it a complete tear? And then if it's a partial tear, uh, semi-quantitatively graded as low, intermediate, high grade, so on and so forth. If it's a complete tear, uh, this is where the plain film can come in handy. You may actually be dealing with an ACL evulsion fracture, so look for a fracture fragment. If you have a plain film, often the plain film will show that uh, to greater advantage. Um, if it's a complete tear, it's also helpful to say if it's from the femoral attachment, mid-substance, or off the tubal insertion. And so very uh, 
common example of a high of a complete ACL tear will be one where the tear is right at the femoral attachment and instead of seeing that nice femoral origin you just see white here or increased signal and then you'll typically see an abnormal horizontal lie of the fibers on your sagittal so that should be an immediate tip off some ACLs you're going to see they look intact but they're expanded and they have diffuse increased signal um, like into a turkey drumstick uh, not shown here of course in this normal example and that um, has been likened to uh, mucoid degeneration or intrasubstance ganglion formation and I take that to mean that there's been some previous uh, partial injury to the ACL but clearly no no um, full thickness disruption so that should be reported okay let's move on to the PCL the PCL is actually a lot easier uh, you can take your pick of any sequence generally and and look at it on that one sequence and you should be fine uh, it is uh, homogeneous low signal all sequences so most people actually don't have too much trouble uh, diagnosing PCL tears. We did talk about those meniscal femoral ligaments of Humphrey and Risberg here, and they can they can give some apparent contour irregularity to the PCL, but uh, resist the temptation to mistake that for pathology again. With ACL and PCL tears, you may see associated secondary findings. For example, you might see an anterior posterior drawer sign corresponding to ACL or PCL injury respectively and there are a whole host of other secondary signs but I've generally not emphasized those because MR gives you such a great direct assessment of the ligament itself I find that there's no need or use to rely on those secondary findings but they can be helpful in settings where it's a chronic injury and um, the read of the primary ligament itself is a little tougher okay so we've done the menisci and we've done the cruciate ligaments now let's look at the cloudal ligaments and let's start on the medial side just because it's easier and as we look at the cloud ligaments, uh, you'll see most people using the chrono to look at the cloud ligaments, and I do too. I think that's a quick and easy way to get at them. But I want you to become familiar with looking at these structures on axial as well, because on the axial plane, we cut through these structures in cross-section, and especially in the setting of complex internal derangements, it gets easier to sort out each individual structure uh, from the others in the vicinity if you're comfortable following these structures on axial. So let's again start on the medial side. So as you know the superficial MCL starts several centimeters above the joint line and then extends several centimeters below the joint line and it should appear as a low signal homogeneous structure as you see here. So that's a nice normal superficial MCL. All right. Um, and let's just follow it on the axial here. So here's the from attachment up here and then we just follow it down notice that it maintains its nice normal smooth contour homogeneous low signal throughout and that's a normal MCL with regards to the deep MCL uh, you're going to see these tiny fibers here this is the meniscal femoral component this is the meniscal tibial component and I wouldn't worry too much about those for now you, you get a call and they ask you about the MCL on a case generally they're talking about the superficial MCL uh, you may see a slip of fluid or high signal between the meniscus and the MCL and oftentimes that is fluid within the so-called tibial cloudal ligament bursa not to be mistaken for pathology. Uh, I want to emphasize the posterior oblique ligament and that's this thin um, ligamentous structure here running from the back of the superficial MCL and eventually become contiguous with the semimerminosis uh, attachment near the proximal tibia here and let's just try to bring this up on sagittal okay so it's going to be this this sheath of fibers here okay so when you have your knee fully extended and you apply a valgus stress you're actually testing the posterior oblique ligament here and when you have your knee flexed to 30 degrees and apply valgus stress you're actually testing the superficial MCL so this complex of structures, the posterior oblique ligament, semimerminosis attachment to the proximal tibia, um, posterior meniscal capsular junction, these are all components of the so-called posterior medial corner. But for now, I just want to point out the posterior oblique ligament. If you have a multi-ligament injury, um, then this structure often has to be assessed because this has to be addressed in the reconstruction or else uh, the prognosis is poorer. Okay. Great. So now let's turn our attention to the, uh, oh, before we do, let's talk about injuries to the MCL. So let's say we see that the MCL is intact, but it's thickened and heterogeneous. And generally, I'll call that a sprain. 
um, if we actually see thinning or defects in the MCL, then we're doing tears, either partial thickness or complete. And once again, I generally will give a semi-quantitative grading as to the severity of it's a partial tear. Is it low grade, intermediate grade, high grade, so on and so forth. Um, sometimes it's helpful to say if it's the proximal third, distal third, or kind of in the mid-substance here, or middle third, I should say. Great. Okay, so there are more structures on the lateral side, so it can be a little trickier, but not too bad if we approach it systematically. So from anterior to posterior, we have the iliotibial band, okay, and then as I scroll slightly more posteriorly, we have that popliteus, right, and then we have the LCL coming off the lateral femoral condyle and inserting on the lateral aspect of the fibrillar head, and then even more posteriorly still, we have the biceps femoris muscle and then the tendon, and it too, uh, inserting onto the lateral aspect of the fibular head. Okay, so I'm just going to pull up the sagittal for a second because I think it's helpful um, to help us. We want to, of course, assess these structures on the, the sagittal sequence, but it gives us a nice sense of the overall orientation of these structures. So this is the uh, lateral cloud ligament or fibular cloud ligament, and this is a far lateral sagittal image. And as we scroll back and forth between these two images, we can see that the LCL as we go inferior also uh, extends posterior okay, and extends slightly lateral and remembering that allows us or helps us find and assess the LCL on our axial sequence so let's try to blow this up a little bit okay so this is the lateral femoral condo and I'm going to slowly scroll inferiorly and what you're going to see is the LCL going lateral and posterior as I scroll inferiorly. So there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is, and you can see it gradually joining with the biceps femoris uh, to form the conjoint tendon, and both of these structures inserting again on the lateral aspect of the fibular head, and that's important to note. So if you're looking at a plane form, you see an evulsion fracture, you can actually deduce if it's involving the LCL slash biceps femoris by where the defect is on the fibular head. There are other structures, secondary ligamentous stabilizers, that insert kind of more either on the tip of the fibula styloid or at least more medial to the biceps femoris LCO insertions. But we won't go over too many of those today. Uh, I think for your first run through a knee MR, it's not critical, but just because it shows so nicely, this, by the way, is the popliteal fibula ligament. Again, that's just um, FYI at this point. So we had talked about the popliteus tendon, and I like to follow the popliteus by going to a far inferior axial image where you'll see the popliteus muscle belly. And then we just slowly scroll superiorly, and we will eventually get to the muscular tendon's junction of popliteus. And then we're going to watch that tendon traverse the popliteus hiatus, right? And remember, we saw it going by the posterior horn lateral meniscus. Here it is again. And it's going to start on the lateral femoral condyle, just a little anterior and just a little inferior to where the LCL came off. All right, And so we will such assess each of these structures just much like the MCL. Is it thickened and heterogeneous? Sprain? Is there a defect? Partial tear? Is it completely torn? Complete tear from which side? The femoral side, the fibula side, or middle third? Um, for popliteus, it's an analogous situation. It's a tendon, so if we see thickening or heterogeneity of the tendon we might call tendinosis and we see tears and those are described in similar fashion uh, note too that you may have disruption of the muscle or of the muscular tendon's junction more 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 inferiorly so be cognizant of that and make sure you assess the full course of the structure and of course the iliotibial band the most anterior, stru anterior structure which is shown quite nicely here and you can see it inserting quite nicely on Gertie's tubercle here at the anterolateral aspect of the proximal tibia. Increasingly, the literature has talked about something called the anterolateral ligament, but I'll let you kind of explore that on, on your own. I, I don't think it's critical to know about the anterolateral ligament at this time, but just be aware that there are new structures that we'll eventually have to look at in, in detail as well. Okay, so we've done the menisci, we've done the cruciate ligaments and collateral ligaments, and now we'll look at the extensor mechanism, including retinacula. And so, um, generally, the extensor mechanism assessment starts with an assessment of the quadriceps and patellar tendons. And let's start with the quadriceps tendon. It, too, is yet another one of these structures that can have a nice, normal, strided appearance. So, uh, 
Once again, increased signal in this quadriceps insertion, not necessarily indicative of pathology. I just want you to get used to this striated appearance. Okay, and we beyond that, we're hoping to see a nice homogeneous appearance, low signal of the tendon insertion here. We're not getting too, too much of it. But aside from those striations I talked about, this looks pretty good. If it, once again, if it looks heterogeneous and thickened, we might query some tendinosis. And if we see actual um, disruptions in it or fluid signal um, defects within the tendon, then we're going to start talking about partial thickness tears. Um, and then if, if there's complete discontinuity, then we're dealing with a full thickness tear. And we may actually see in the same quadriceps tendon rupture a uh, patella baja, so patella kind of sinking down uh, inferiorly. Um, if there's a partial tear, sometimes it's helpful to give an approximate cross-sectional area percentage of involvement. That seems to be a very intuitive figure that um, the reader can, can really hang their hat on. And then we scroll more inferiorly and we look at the patella tendon. Some people call this a ligament because it attaches one bone to another. I like to liken it to a tendon because I feel like its function is more of that a tendon, but I, I think that's a minor point. Uh, the patella tendon should generally have homogeneous low signal, like other tendons. Um, be careful if you're dealing with a short TE sequence, okay, so either a T1 or, as in this case, proton density sequence, then you may see artifactually increased signal um, as portions of the patella tendon may be oriented 55 degrees to the, um, the magnet. And so on our protocol, you can easily check to see if high signal in the patella tendon is due to myotic angle artifact by simply looking on our axial, because our axial is a true T2 where you should not get magic angle artifacts at all. And you can see, especially in the axial, nice homogeneous low signal throughout. So that's the patella tendon. Um, we've talked about the quadriceps tendon. And then let's talk about briefly just the retinacula. So the retinacula are actually a more complex structure than I think we give it credit for. There are components that run from the patella to the femur, from the patella to meniscus, from the patella to the tibia, and it's actually a sheath of uh, ligamentous fibers. On the medial side, there is a dominant uh, medial patellofemoral ligament, and it's not uncommon for it to look a little attenuated, if you will, or irregular in some locations. So generally, I will focus more attention to this if there has been either MCL injury, because the MCL origin and MPFL origin are pretty much in the same location, or if there's been, say, a transient patella dislocation or something like that. All right. Uh, otherwise, I'll just do a quick uh, look through. As we're looking at the extension mechanism, also, I think it's helpful to look at the, um, the peripatellar fatty tissues, so the suprapatella fat pad, prefemoral fat pad, Hoffa's fat pad, or the infrapatella fat pad. Um, occasionally, or actually fairly commonly, we will see edema in these fat pads, and generally that is a secondary finding suggestive of some sort of patellofemoral maltracking. Um, we won't talk into the specifics of how to diagnose trochlear dysplasia or lateralization of the tibial tubercle, but suffice to say, if I see um, severe cartilage wear, and we're going to talk about cartilage in a second here, then generally, or if there is a, a case of patellar uh, dislocation, then I will uh, look at, at these factors as well and see if they are indeed present, but that's not part of my normal routine for every single knee. Okay, so we've talked about the menisci, we've talked about the cruciate ligaments, cloud ligaments, extension mechanism, and now we're going to talk about cartilage. And I think the cartilage assessment is difficult first, and certainly when I was starting out, it took up a lot of my time. But I think this is also where we add tremendous value uh, to the clinician because there's there's a lot of cartilage wear that you'll see on MRI that is simply plain from occult, and it can go a long way to explaining a lot of unexplained um, signs and symptoms that the patient may be experiencing. So roughly we kind of grade cartilage uh, uh, roughly according to the elder bridge classification that they use at arthroscopy. There are many classifications, but the elder bridge one has been one that I've been uh, familiar with and I continue to use that to this day. So when we see, so this is the normal appearance of cartilage here in the sagittal uh, sequence. You can see a nice homogeneous kind of intermediate signal layer throughout. Um, I do want to point out that the cartilage is actually not 
perfectly, perfectly homogeneous in signal, there's in fact a gradient effect. So the deeper you go, actually the lower signal the curlage gets. And I think it's nicely shown in this coronal um, non-fat side. So it's important to be aware that some of this black here is actually still cartilage, all right? Um, so I think there's a tendency to call all of this black subchondral bone plate, but really some of this is actually cartilage, and whether that's simply a reflection of the different orientation of the uh, of the cartilage molecules, or if there's actually um, if it's because of the actual differences in composition between the deep cartilage versus the superficial cartilage. Um, I think that, you know, we could have discussions about that, but just suffice it to, to say, uh, just understand that there is this kind of gradient appearance of cartilage that's normal, as shown here. Okay, so if we see signal heterogeneity in cartilage that is over and above what I've just described, that gradient um, appearance of cartilage, then that generally corresponds, but no thinning, so if it's normal normal thickness, just heterogeneity, no thinning, no no actual defects, then that generally corresponds to when the arthroscopist goes into a knee in surgery and looks and oh there's no defect but they probe the cartilage and it feels soft, okay? So for those of you who like to grade, that would be considered grade one, I would generally call that just mild chondrosis. Um, when we start seeing thinning, then that corresponds to defects that they can actually see at arthroscopy. And if it's about, if it's less than 50% of the thickness, then generally I call that, well, I would call that moderate, but you might call that grade two, okay, if you're someone who likes to grade. If it's more than 50%, then I still call it moderate, you might call it grade three. And I only call it severe or grade four if I see evidence that the cartilage is full thickness. So once again, if you feel like all the cartilage is gone, you're down to the black here, but you don't see secondary changes in the bone, then you may still be seeing some, there may still be some intact overlying cartilage. So I would still call that just moderate. But if you do see secondary changes, so marrow edema or cyst formation, then that's pretty good evidence that joint fluid has gone through this full thickness cartilage defect is now insinuating into bone and I'm happy calling that full thickness cartilage denuding or severe chondrosis or grade 4 chondrosis um, however you like and when I'm assessing so I assess cartilage by compartments and we'll just start with the patelliformal compartment um, when I'm assessing a compartment generally I like to talk about whether the chondrosis is generalized the whole compartment or if there are focal areas you know, there are focal areas, and it looks like it actually might be acute with osteochondral injury. So, for example, if we think this is a case of osteochondritis desiccans, then it might actually give measurements, and I'll look for uh, um, a nauseous fragment either in situ or displaced. Um, if it's more long-standing patellofemoral OA and there's chondrosis everywhere, then I'll probably describe it as diffuse moderate or diffuse moderate chondrosis with focal full thickness cartilage doing either in the medial facet patellar apex, uh, lateral facet, medial lateral femoral trochlea, or whatever. Um, most people will use the axial to assess the patellar femoral cartilage, and I do too, but I would strongly encourage you to pair that with the sagittal, because I find that some high-grade chondrosis along the femoral trochlea, okay, can actually be quite subtle on the axial. So, yes, use your axial, um, just like everyone else, but especially when you're starting out, just make sure you at least do a couple of scrolls through the sagittal and appreciate a nice smooth contour of the um, cartilage. All right? Because if someone's going to miss high-grade chondrosis, generally it's kind of buried deep here in the central trochlea in a situation where they did not go through the sagittal, because usually it's quite apparent on the sagittal. Let's talk about a phaco here while it's on my mind. Let's say we go to an image like there, say, okay? So it might seem like, hey, we have some lateral femoral articular cartilage here over the trochlea. But it looks like we're not getting perfect cartilage here. Why is that? And that's simply just a reflection of the anatomy. So the medial femoral trochlear articular cartilage does not extend nearly as high as that of the lateral, as you can see here. So for example, if we took an image, axial image going right through here, we would of course expect to see intact lateral femoral trochlear cartilage, but we may not see um, intact medial femoral trochlear cartilage simply because the cartilage has actually just starts lower down here. All right. Another question I get asked is, um, let's go to the non-fat side here. Okay, 
when do I put uh, cartilage abnormality in the patellofemoral compartment and when do I put it in the uh, femotibial compartment and generally what I use as the dividing line unfortunately not well shown here is the condylopatellosulcus okay so on the let's see if it shows better on this no not 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 really we'll, we'll stick with this so here's our lateral femoral condyle here's our kind of convex lateral uh, tip of plateau and you're going to see a focal flattening and for the lateral condyle it's about halfway um, through the lateral condyle okay that you see this flattening this uh, parenthetically is also where you get the osteochondral impaction injury and a pivot shift injury uh, so the so-called deep sulcus sign associated with ACL tear but I also use this point to define the extent of the trochlear or patellofemoral cartilage versus the femotibial cartilage so so that's a dividing point for me and then on the medial side you have a similar condylopatellus sulcus but it's actually more anterior it's at the junction of the anterior third and posterior two thirds and admittedly again very hard to see in this patient see this focal flattening here so anything here I would consider medial femoral trochlear cartilage anything back here I would consider um, uh, medial femotibial cartilage. Okay, sometimes you'll see high, some pretty high grade chondrosis way back here, posterior non-weight bearing. I would describe those still, but of course, uh, less clinical significance one would think. So, basically, the exercise we had talked about going through the cartilage in the patellofemoral compartment, I do the same for the medial and lateral uh, compartment cartilage. All right, and you'll find that for the medial and lateral femotibial articular cartilage the chrono and sagittals together work quite nicely um, to give you a nice assessment overall of the cartilage. Okay, so we've done the menisci, cruciate ligaments, cloud ligaments, extensor mechanism, cartilage, and now we're into number six which is miscellaneous and this is where you kind of scroll up and down and you just make sure that you haven't missed anything incidental or anything systemic, something like that. Is there a muscle tumor? Is there a muscle injury? Over time you will gradually learn all these individual muscles. Um, is there a bone marrow edema that's been unaccounted for up to this point in the analysis? Is there a bone lesion, for example, for which we need to um, assess further? Um, something too that I look for in the miscellaneous category is whether or not there's a Baker cyst, right? So when we see a focal fluid collection in the popliteal fossa, there's a tendency to call it a Baker cyst, end of story. But really, we should really ask ourselves, is it? And it's really, it's one of those things in radiology, it, it either is or it isn't. And it is if any part of the collection insinuates between the semimerminosis tendon here and the medial head, of, so this is the medial head of gastrocnemius. So if we see a neck for that collection insinuating between these two, it's a Baker cyst, end of story. All right, and the Baker cyst itself can look complicated. There can be synovial debris, there can be osteocarlagenous bodies within it, there can be synovial thickening. So simply looking at the compo apparent composition of the collection doesn't tell you whether or not it is or isn't a Baker cyst. It's whether or not there's a tongue that extends in this channel here. But if it does, then it can actually extend quite a ways away from 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 this location. It can track up, okay, and it can track way down into the knee, I mean into the leg rather. And actually it can on occasion rupture and you may see a lot of edema around this location. And that may actually be a potential cause for more acute on chronic pain. So we'd like to report those if if they're available. Okay. So I think that's pretty much it for a, a, a basic approach to knee MRI. I think it's just a matter of looking at a lot of these and getting used to what's normal and what's abnormal. And I hope this brief tutorial has been helpful. Thank you very much.